of all, I really want to thank you and Citizen Tales for giving me this opportunity. And I'm so glad that uh, friends from everywhere are here to watch us. And, and I'm delighted. In the beginning, there was the word logos. But uh, that is something that has to do with God, not with us mere mortals. Because for us, in the beginning, there is the image. And that is nonverbal. So I am starting my presentation with this image here, which is a painting of mine that I did like maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. And Vasiliki, when she was uh, selecting images for her first poetry book, Transitorium, she loved it and chose it. And my nonverbal met verbal on her book, which is, yeah, you can't see it. So I used to paint and um, I was dealing with loss and death, the, the big white um, um, butterfly for me is the soul. And I also wanted to deal with death as something is not necessarily black. So I made this deadly red paintings. And in this one, the flowers, which are the first flowers of spring, daffodils, they're looking down into the earth. Then I'm going to show you some self portraits that I did uh, during the quarantine and, and um, you know, pandemic time. They're part of this group of self portraits in isolation. And here it's myself as Medea. And there's a joke that you can only appreciate in Greek because the word Medea in Greek is media. And the word for muscles is also media. It's just uh, spelled differently. So I've always wanted to do something with these two uh, words that sounded the same and I created this silly self-portrait. And here's another one as a warrior and another one of the self-portrait as somebody who contemplates houses, houses that are containing us carnivorously or houses that we no longer inhabit, but they represent nostos. And these are some of my ceramic houses because um, as uh, Vasiliki said, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, meaning uh, painting, photography, printmaking, ceramics, writing, five of them. So these houses, which are not very big, they do not have roof and they do not have floors and sometimes they are out of whack, their doors are open, their doors are missing. And it's my way of dealing with the nostos of my house or the apartment building. I grew up in the Saloniki. The city and the nostos and the friendships that I can no longer reach because of the pandemic. And this is an attempt um, I had the show of this work. I named it Prince of Houses. From here, let's go to my ceramics. I only started working with ceramics in 2016. And the reason I did that was because I had two choices to do nothing and be really depressed because of the loss of a friendship or build something with my hands and let the grief, let the, let the pain go into soil and take shape. So these are some of my plates that they have been very successfully 
um, accepted by the community. I found that working with ceramics, it was a really, really interesting way combining the plasticity of the, of the material with all my knowledge of painting and printmaking. And also there is another element that exists in printmaking though, the unforeseen result, which in the beginning I, I felt startled and I'm like, oh, I hate that it's not perfect, but it's exactly this perfection of non-perfection that makes the piece into a piece of art rather than just another functional ceramic. Last year, it was the uh, celebration of the commemoration of 200 years uh, since the Greek Revolution. And as we all know, black and, I mean, blue and white is the Greek colors. This is my contribution or my uh, work that celebrates the birth of our nation or rebirth of our nation. This one is a vessel that you really cannot use, but you can admire, you can hold in your hands, and you can collect like a lot of people do. It's a technique called raku. It's an old Japanese technique. Unfortunately, the um, the way it is made, it doesn't give you, the ceramic is porous and uh, the um, metals are poisonous. So there's no way you can drink or eat out of it, but it's a vessel and it's a piece of beauty. And this is another series of my work that I call paleofuturistic because it is obvious that my, um, my source of inspiration comes from all this Neolithic, Paleolithic uh, ceramics that are in museums in Greece. And also uh, a lot of the ceramics in, uh, of, of um, American Indians are of the same graphic quality. So these are my paleofuturistic pieces. And here are some more. And this, again, in the same line of uh, ancient uh, pottery translated into contemporary image, are these wing phalluses and the seashells, for not mention another word, uh, which is was part of a uh, big um, installation and um, it's called the origin of the world. In printmaking, I was, um, I was on a residency in the art print residence in, uh, in outside of Barcelona in Spain before, uh, in, in 2019, before the pandemic came. And um, I chose the vessel as, as my imagery. And uh, I really went to town experimenting, combining, printing for three amazing weeks. Spain seems to have been a very important place for me because as I mentioned before, maybe, I did have the opportunity to walk the Camino, which is an ancient pilgrimage towards the um, Santiago de Compostela, in Spain. The original uh, street is the original way. It's about uh, 800 kilometers, about 500 miles. I only walked a little less than 300 miles of them, but still, a very, very important um, experience because regardless the reason I did it, it was really amazing and very empowering to realize that one step after the other can take you any more of my vessel images. 
This is from another residency in Lincoln, Nebraska, and so is this. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, these monoprints I did years ago, and they're called Animula blandula vagula, Animule. They're called little souls. They're dedicated to the soul that it's always young and always a child that grows inside every single woman, no matter what the age, the good luck to have them exposed in uh, the Craft Alliance. It's a gallery here in St. Louis, outside on the window, like a laundry, and also in Villa Tala, art village in Liguria. And in the old days, the people of the village used to do the laundry. So I thought that was a great choice. Well, eventually <laughs> the little Animula uh, hit rock bottom and uh, flame. And um, this was created, the, the loss of, of a person, of a, of a country, of a house, of a lifestyle that we already knew uh, became part of my image. Uh, so I will only show you one of the prints that has the, I used an open box as a matrix for printing. And I created almost like an architectural floor plan where the balcony, the living room, the bedrooms, the kitchens used to be because of all the refugees that we have around, it's time to think about what is the permanency of what we already know as given our houses, our surrounding. At this point, I'm going to read to you a short story that I wrote that has to do a lot with uh, the home, the nostos, and it's called Ο Μονόλογος της Συμφάντας. Πόσο θα ήθελα να μπορούσα να φύγω. Με έχει κουράσει ο έρωτας του λέω και το κρύο της Βιέννης. Δεν λέω, ο άντρας μου είναι τώρα πια η οικογένειά μου. Αλλά ακόμα θυμάμαι με νοσταλγία τον τόπο που γεννήθηκα και μεγάλωσα. Την ηλιόλου στη Μαδρίτη. Τι ταξίδι μεγάλο και τρομακτικό ήταν εκείνο. Τότε που μικρό, οκτάχρονο κορίτσι, με ένα μεγάλο φιόγκο στα μαλλιά, σαν κούκλα ζωντανή, με έστειλε η μαμά στον παππού, τον αυτοκράτορα. Σε όλο το δρόμο έκλεγα φοβισμένη και για να με παρεγορήσουν οι πιστές μου ακόλουθοι, κορίτσια νεαρά, έβγαζαν από όμορφα κουτιά ζωγραφιστά, φλούδες από πορτοκάλι, βουτυγμένες σε σοκολάτα και τις μοιραζόμασταν. Πέντε κουτιά σοκολατάκια δρόμο η Βιέννη. Εκεί με περίμενε η αγκαλιά των παππούδων μου που ευτυχώς με αγαπούσαν πολύ και μου έκαναν όλα τα χατήρια. Θυμάμαι που τριγυρνούσαμε με τα κορίτσια στις κουζίνες και ανοίγαμε τα βάζα με τα γλυκίσματα που τα τρώγαμε κρυφά από όλου. Το μυστικό γρήγορα φανερώθηκε γιατί η ζάχαρη χαλάει τα δόντια και ο οικογενειακός γιατρός μας μάλωνε. Όμως εγώ είμαι πριγκίπισσα, δεν θα μου πει ένας οι περισσότεροι γιατροί τι να κάνω. Μεγάλωσα στα πούπουλα και όταν ήρθε η ώρα μου, τον 12ο Απρίλη της ζωής μου, τη μέρα του Πάσχα, αραβωνιάστηκα τον λέω. Ο μπαμπάς μου ο βασιλιάς έστειλε δώρο για τους αραβώνες ένα μεγάλο μπλε άχρηστο διαμάντι. Θα προτιμούσα να μου είχε στείλει ένα μπαούλο με φλούδες πορτοκαλιού βουτυγμένε σε σοκολάτα. Τα διαμάντια δεν τρώγονται, ούτε μπορείς να παίξεις βόλους μαζί τους γιατί δεν κατρακυλούν. Ο γάμος έγινε λίγες μέρες πριν τα Χριστούγεννα. Η γιορτή κράτησε μέρες και το μόνο που θυμάμαι είναι τα εξαίσια γλυκίσματα. Και φυσικά το βράδυ που πήγα νύφη στο διαμέρισμα του Λέω που με το ζόρι κρατιόμουν να μην βάλω τα κλάματα από την τρομάρα μου. Εκείνος τότε με σήκωσε στα χέρια του και με κάθισε σε ένα τραπέζι. Έβγαλε τα μεταξωτά μου παπούτσια τραγουδώντας ένα παιδικό τραγουδάκι. Αυτό το πασουμάκι το πήρε ο λαγός. 
το άλλο σου το άρπαξε μεγάλο αετός. Τις κάλτσες θα τις δώσουμε να ζεσταθούν τα φίδια. Τα μισοφόρια έκλεψαν διάφανα σαν μια μύδια. Τραγουδώντας μου έβγαλε σιγά σιγά όλα τα ρούχα. Μετά έλυσε τις κορδέλες που κρατούσαν τα μαλλιά μου, πήρε μια βούρτσα και άρχισε να με χτενίζει. Εγώ έτρεμα από τον φόβο μου, αλλά ο Λέο χτενίζε τα μαλλιά μου τραγουδώντας τώρα ένα άλλο τραγούδι, ένα νανούρισμα. Έτσι πέρασα την πρώτη νύχτα του γάμου μου σαν κούκλα που την ετοιμάζουν για ύπνο. Αυτό το παιχνίδι κράτησε καιρό, μέχρι που ξεθάρεψα και άρχισα να παίζω κι εγώ μαζί του. Μάλιστα δεν έβλεπα την ώρα να πουσυρθούμε στο διαμέρισμά του. Τώρα πια δεν χρειαζόταν τραγουδάκια για να βγάλω τα ρούχα μου. Και ο Λέο που έβλεπε πως μεγάλωνα άρχισε να μου φέρεται όπως φέρεται στις νέες κυρίες επί των τιμών. Έτσι από κούκλα έγινα αρχιδούκησα και γυναίκα. Και αμέσω μετά τον θάνατο του παππού αυτοκρατόρισα. Το κρύο όμως της Βιέννης είναι το ίδιο αβάσταχτο είτε είμαι αρχιδούκησα είτε αυτοκρατόρισα. In Fanta's monologue Oh, how I wish I could leave. I'm tired of Leo's lovemaking and Vienna's cold climate. I know that my husband is my family now, but I'm still nostalgic for my birthplace, the beautiful, sunny Madrid. My trip from there was utterly terrifying. I was only eight years old with a big bow on my head when my mom, the queen, sent me off to her dad, the emperor. All the way, I was scared and crying. My meninas trying to console my grief opened a beautifully painted box full of orange peels dipped in chocolate and shared them with me. We ate five whole boxes by the time we reached Vienna. My grandparents welcomed me in their court and made sure that every one of my wishes were granted, spoiled me with love. I remember rummaging unnoticed through the palace kitchens, finding vases with candied fruit eating huge quantities. Unfortunately, a toothache revealed our secret and the palace doctors scolded us. But I am a princess. No doctor can tell me what to do. On Easter day, the 12th April of my life had arrived and I became engaged to Leo. My father, the king, sent a big blue diamond as an engagement gift. I would rather have received a big trunk full of chocolate covered orange peels. I cannot eat the diamond. I cannot even play with it. Diamonds cannot roll like marbles. We got married a few days before Christmas the very same year. The wedding festivities lasted three days, but I only remember the exquisite desserts and of course the wedding night. The first time I was brought to my husband's apartments, I could hardly keep from bursting into tears. I was terrified. Leo picked me up and sat me on a tabletop, took the slippers off my feet singing, this little slipper the rabbit took, this little slipper was snatched by the eagle We'll give your stockings to the snakes to keep them warm. Your petticoats go to the lizards to enhance their form. Singing, he took off all my clothes. Then he untied the ribbons that held my hair together and with brush in hand, combed my hair. I was shivering more from fear than from cold. But Leo started singing a lullaby and I spent my wedding night like a big doll that is prepared for bed. We played this game for quite some time. 
little by little, I started looking forward, retiring to my husband's apartments. And eventually there was no more need for nursery rhymes to take my clothes off. Leo, having realized that I had grown up, started treating me like the ladies in the court. And just like that, I was no longer a doll. I had become a woman, an archduchess. And after grandpa's death, an empress. Still, Vienna is equally a cold place, regardless of my status. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to read another poem this time. And I believe it's in the very beginning. Well, I will, I will continue with this one, but Panda. Ο πυλός του σώματός μου κρατάει στη μνήμη του την αίσθηση της αφήσου ακόμα κι αν φύγεις και αν αφήσεις. Τα δακτυλικά μας αποτυπώματα θα μείνουν για πάντα αγκαλιασμένα πάνω στα δώρα που έχουμε ανταλλάξει. Forever, the clay of my body holds the memory of your touch. Even when you will be gone, even when you will leave me, our fingerprints will be forever embraced on the gifts we have exchanged. And um, a last, well, I want to end with this, Vasiliki, but I want to read another um, poem in Greek. There. Pilina Loya. Τα χέρια μου. Πλοκάμια που απλώνονται αγγίζουν τον πυλό να γίνει κύπελο για να χωρέσει το κρασί που έχω να σε κεράσω. Τα χέρια μου μιλούν μαζί σου γλώσσα κοφάλαια. Words of clay. The tentacles of my fingers transform a lump of clay to hold the wine I want to share with you. My hands communicate in sign language. And... Uh, to end with, I have to say, clay wet, heavy, malleable, cool, makes my fingers tired, yet it is pleasant to the touch. Cool, sensual, moist earth, full of possibilities. This low tech ancient art ties me back with the past, brings me forward into the future. It centers me. And, um, well, this is my information. And this is Vasiliki in my studio two years ago before the pandemic in front of uh, some of my um, ceramics. And uh, if you scroll a little lower, Vasilikula, I thank Vasiliki Rapti for giving me this opportunity and also Peter Boteas for graciously accepting to read my work. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all. That was a wonderful, rich presentation. And uh, I'm sure everybody has questions for you, Nancy. It was so touching to start with this moment uh, of transitorium. Um, I, I actually did not know that you also dealt with loss and death when you created this. So it was not accidental that immediately I chose this this work of yours to go with my poetry collection uh, with the same title, Transitorium, because I was also dealing with loss um, at that time. So thank you for, for sharing and, and graciously. And it was so interesting when you said that the encounter of logos with image with Icona. Um, and you showed us very well your journey from one to the another, it's never ending. And you have so many different trajectories in your art, so multidisciplinary, multimodal, multimedia. And um, it's, it's an incredible experiment that uh, you're, you're trying to find this 
perfection within the imperfection as so beautifully you said in your presentation. So um, I'm really thankful that you are a member of Citizen Tales and, and you, you presented your work. And um, I want to open it to questions to everyone in, in this room for you. And thank you for, for your uh, reading as well, Peter. So, you know, I'm, I, I know a vessel is a container, but it can be more than a container. So my question is, what is, was vessel for you? Mm. A vessel is the whole, H-O-L. Um, and the vessel also, I, I mean, our hearts have four vessels, four pockets. And the vessel is where food is contained and gives us life. And heart is where life is contained and love. So the vessel becomes this metaphor for something primordial and very, very important. And here's one. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Everything that you have shown us until now was concluded in the last poem and your connection with the past and the future. And I think that this is the essential part of your work, this connection with your inner self and the past and the future. And I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. I, I have seen parts of your work, but this whole image is really fascinating. And I think a vessel is a whole with an H, but it is the whole with WH as well. Exactly. And I think also that the vessel is our body. Well, that's why I mentioned the heart. Right. Yeah. So beautifully, you described the whole and the whole. <laughs> um, and absolutely, I agree with you, Chloe, that uh, this is representative of Nancy's itinerary and, and dedication to the art. I wanted to, to hear more about your pilgrimage, Nancy. This was a, a moment, a significant moment in your life, in your art. Uh, if there was um, a description of your, the turn that your art took after that significant moment, how would you describe it? What would you say? You happened to be there where the first <laughs> blow came in Naxos. You just didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the loss of that friendship was like so profoundly hurting to me that uh, I really wanted to take the, the streets and run and, and, and I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, so I've always wanted to do this pilgrimage because I've always thought it was incredible one can walk all these miles and uh, I didn't do it immediately because I realized that if you are a couch potato or I'm not a couch potato but if you're not a, somebody who's used to walking the, the least you need to know is what shoes to wear so I prepared myself I had a very good luck to um, mentioned to a friend of mine, Susan Sontag, when I came back to St. Louis, that I wanted to do the pilgrimage. And she said, oh, I have a friend who has a friend who is in St. Louis and she did the pilgrimage a few years ago. So that connection put the gears in move. I have to say that it wasn't, I, I was crying in the car from fear when my kids were taking me to the airport. And, and I was like, Oh my God, what am I doing? How stupid is this? Or what if, what if something happens to me? But then I relaxed and I met people who helped and I had injuries. I lost my glasses. Well, 
I have my glasses. I just don't wear them right now. I lost these glasses. And by sheer miracle, but also with me talking about losing my glasses, I found them. It was empowerment walking all these miles. It was really incredible. I had to sleep in the same room with men that I had never met in my life. And I have to say, I was scared. <laughs> I mean, they were nice people, nothing happened, but you expose yourself out there and it's, and you don't know what is going to happen. You, you go with faith in the universe that somehow will provide, but what if? I had a tremendous injury. I found out that whatever little injuries I have had in my feet, on my feet before, they all came out. I, I couldn't walk one day. I had to walk, I, I was walking five kilometers, which is nothing. And I was hurting so much that I pulled my head down. I was looking on the ground <laughs> and me, somebody who doesn't really believe in God or whatever, or at least I am agnostic. I kept saying, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, which was humbling to tell you the truth. But it was the only thing I could come up with to, to endure the pain and, and manage to arrive to the, um, to the nunnery that I ended up with, to, to whatever you call it. So it was an incredible thing to do, an incredible choice, an incredible way that I would probably do again. I don't know if I will be able, and I didn't do the whole thing because I knew there was no way that I would start up on the mountains and then go down there. There was no way I would do that. But I chose to start from the Meseta, which is flat. It was this time of the year, May 25. And uh, it was beautiful. They were poppy fields everywhere and to walk in inside this poppy fields with nothing else no one else around you and and listen to the tick tock tick tock of your uh baton and I, it was and and i felt total freedom which is something that it's so valuable so precious so what if it rained all over me a couple of days it was okay i dried out my clothes and i mean you get into this mode that honestly there were times that i felt like i was um, in the military because every day i had to plan my way for the next day i did not carry my backpack thank god for some pellegrin that i met the first day that told me oh my dear husband pays five euros every day and there is a service that takes your backpack to the next stop. Would you, I have an extra envelope. Would you like to have it? And I said, yes, by all means, we became friends. Still, I had every day, I had to learn Spanish. So I would call the next albergue, the next hostel I would stay. I, I had to communicate. That was another great thing. So I don't, it, it, it was maybe after giving birth to my children was the next biggest thing I've ever done. So wonderful. It seems like a physical iteration of your own journey as an artist. <laughs> and well, I, I, born, I, I was born as, I mean, I have always been an artist for God's sakes, but after I came back, of course, my suitcase with the Compostela got lost on the plane, on, on, you know, in transit. So I came back without anything. And it's a shame not to have your piece of paper. But one day the doorbell rang and they brought it home. So I didn't have to carry all that. <laughs> so that was another miracle. But the other thing is the week I arrived back, I got a phone call. Uh, from my mother-in-law saying that in the studio building, she had her studio, there is one available. And it so happened it was the right amount of uh, 
of money for the rent. So that was the beginning. That was like the birth. I, I see Peter has his uh, hand raised. Nancy, thank you. Um, I'm curious as to how both the vulnerability that you experienced on the Camino and, and also the freedom has translated into your artistic expression, either through visual art, through ceramics, or through, uh, through the written word? I can only speak about the ceramics because um, the vulnerability shows in the imperfection of the work I make. And honestly, I don't make it on purpose. I just am not perfect. And, and, and it's, it's okay. I learned that it's okay. The Japanese have this, this expression, this idea of the wabi-sabi, which is the, non, the beauty of the, the imperfection. And that gave me license, gave me freedom to go on. When I first saw my plates, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? They're not pieces of paper. I have to do something. So I showed them to somebody and said, why don't you show them to this restaurateur, Ben Poremba, who has like a whole bunch of wonderful restaurants here in St. Louis. So since I've always liked this person, I went there, I showed the five plates and I said, here, I have this, do you care to buy them? I sold them for $11 each, I didn't care. He bought them immediately and he said, make a hundred, I'll buy them all. So that summer I stayed here, I made a hundred. <laughs> I contacted him, no word, nothing. He was on vacation, I didn't know it. So I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do with a hundred pieces of ceramic? So I put them on Facebook on Monday, by Friday they were mostly gone. <laughs> People were buying them like hotcakes. And then he showed up and he bought 30, the ones that they were left. So imperfection sometimes is something that we really have to, to take in, yeah, to embrace. And, and maybe the, the secret of becoming better is exactly the notion of imperfection because it gives you room to try more and go beyond and test your own limits. But you have to be aware of the imperfection. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Otherwise you cannot put the, ref the effort that is needed to go <laughs> beyond that, right? We said also in the previous presentation with uh, um, poetry as psychotherapy, in a way, art is psychotherapy again. That's what I'm seeing here. And you confirm it, Nancy. Do you want to tell us? If you agree, <laughs> before I started saying I either had to pay a lot of money, and that part I forgot to tell it, to, to go to a shrink to deal with my grief or turn into create creative outlet, which is clay. And the clay really, I mean, there was even some article in the New York Times recently saying that people now they use clay as therapy because uh, of the microbes in the, in the soil and stuff. Maybe it is true, but definitely it, it, it's the greatest outlet for letting go and creating. If I could add to that, um, it's not just letting go, but it's also transforming. Exactly. Exactly. It's bringing about transformation both within, but also in, in what you're working with in your hands. You're seeing something take shape and something change shape. Right. And that's, that's a lovely metaphor for, uh, for the, the inward things. And to tell you the truth, this is something that happened to me only with clay. If something broke, because I used to make these extremely thin vessels, and if something broke, I would shrug and say, it's okay, it's only clay, I will make another one. If a painting went wrong, I would be furious. If a print would go wrong, I would try again, but I would be feeling, you know, betrayed. But clay, it's only clay. <laughs> it's only earth. Maybe Nancy, I, I'm, I'm really excited to 
to hear you talking about your um, clay, your your work uh, that uh, you created for on the occasion of the bicentennial of the work of independence. They're so beautiful. <laughs> and the, the colors are Greek. So tell us more, how did um, this idea come to you and how did you materialize it? Before the pandemic, some um, Korean ceramic artist came to the school I was going and she was working with porcelain that she was painting with special colors that they look very much like watercolors. Only three years into making uh, pottery. So I've always thought that ah, I'm not ready for porcelain. Porcelain is something really lofty and you have to be a really good, uh, you have to have very skill to be very skillful. So I, I had dismissed it. And then when I realized that, you know, porcelain is nothing but a three-dimensional paper surface, white surface waiting to be um, painted. So hold on one minute, I'm gonna bring you some, uh, some things that I made. So I started creating with porcelain. First they were terrible, but then I came up with flat surfaces. So why does the vessel have to be like everybody else's? And I started painting. And one of the first things were little rounds that I was painting. And these are on porcelain. And also, I don't know if you can see it, they, they I have used three-dimensional um, textures to, to that. So I was doing that and, and then I thought, mm, I should do something for the summer, blue and white. And I started playing with that. And by then it was the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. And I thought, why don't I make something to honor our 200 years of revolution. So that's how the blue and white um, ceramics started happening. I have. This is beautiful. I would say there's no imperfection in that series of your works. <laughs> Very beautiful. Thank you. Maybe you can, you can tell us more about um, the moment you realize that it's clay that you want to really work with? When I realized that on clay, I could, uh, the disciplines I knew well, that is painting and, and printmaking and color, uh, you know, met and the result was really interesting. I became obsessed. Only recently, I don't wake up in the morning and read about uh, clay because now we have a baby and I wake up in the morning and I'm looking at the pictures. But I was, I have never been so obsessed with one discipline of art in my life like I did with clay. And it's really funny because clay, I always considered it as a lesser art, but I beg to differ because I think what you do with it, it's the most important thing. For me is the best medium. And then at some point, uh, my teacher, Jim Ivor, like uh, three or four years ago, he was showing work of people and he showed a couple of my paleo futuristic pieces. And he said, without saying whose they are, this is the work of somebody you have to keep an eye on. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what an honor. And you know, little things like that, they, they boost your confidence. And then you find the way and you know that's your way. And I also love to write. You know, I, I don't know whether my writing is on that same level or it doesn't matter, but I love to write.
That's another thing. Get up in the morning and write or before you go to bed. Write a journal. It doesn't matter what you write. Write. I want to ask Nancy, why do, don't uh, your houses have a roof? What does symbolize for you? Is it a sense of freedom? I mean, okay, it's imperfection. And as we said, the perfection is a part of art. But what does it symbolize for you? Not living in my country. That's what. I mean, I am here very well protected. And, and I thank my good luck and God and everything. Uh, but it's hard for me to accept that this is my home here. And that was one of the lessons of the Camino. And that's why there is no roof and no floor. Um, and one of the big lessons of the Camino was this, you know, you walk, you go to the church and stuff, and you see that, which is really weird. I'm not going to go into this. <laughs> Everything is gold there. It's like, oh my God, this is a poverty walk. Walk and you arrive to this place that there's so much gold that you don't. You, you think that you're in India. Uh, but anyway, you keep on going. I didn't walk there, but I, I took a bus and I went to Finisterra, to the end of the world. And oof, what is there? What else but the Atlantic Ocean? And what's in what is for me? the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, home. So that was a wake up call that girl, you walked to the end of this continent because you are on the other. But still my, my houses will not have a roof and a floor. <laughs> Being in your country of origin, the country of the heart, even though your your life is lovely where you are and the environment that you're in is is what you need right now. But uh, this is something that that also links to what we were talking about with Espina in our last talk about the sense of displacement in a sense, um, mm -hmm. uh, not being in one's own language, not being in in one's own country, and yet finding a way to make, to find belonging, to find community. Um, and yet there is still that, that sense of longing, that sense of nostalgia, uh, the, and the nostos that you were talking about before, that's, that's always present. And Vasiliki and I have talked a lot about this as well. And it comes out in, in, in both of our poetries. Um, so, but what I wanted to ask you though, you said that you've always been an artist and I'm curious as to whether you remember the first time you ever did something with your hands that expressed something creatively, artistically, emotionally. With, with plastelini, do you know what plastelini? Yeah, yeah. Pl plasticine. Plasticine, they used huh. to give plastelini when I was like, two, three years old. And I remember using the chair as a table and making things, but that ended because then later on, I was given watercolors and the plasticine was left behind. And I've always painted and I also always wrote, I found my notebook from second grade or third grade where I kept diary. I don't know which one it is. I think it was second grade. And I never stopped. The reason I didn't become a writer is because I don't know spelling very well. <laughs> which is not a big deal anymore. <laughs> but you do bring clay in your poetry. Pilina Loya, after all, what a beautiful image and, and idea behind and fusion of your passions. <laughs> um, and, and all what is the first time I went to, I, I dealt with clay, I took a class. First thing they told us is like, you have to work it well because the clay has memory. 
this was the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. And also I found something that working with clay, that it's good for clay, but not for people. The more you hit it, the softer it becomes. The more you punish people, the more you hit people, the harder they become, you know, they, but not with clay. You hit it and it becomes really soft. And, and I found also your series, the Paleo Futuristic uh, series of ceramic is so interesting in creating, opening a dialogue with uh, ancient Neolithic or whatever you want, the uh, tradition that you bear with you. So how do you find yourself in, in, in relation to melanomorphagia, for instance, or you, you draw inspiration from there and gramica, you could see also in the samples you showed us. The, 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 my heart is with the paleo and neolithic expression. The <clears throat> melanomorpha, all the attic or even South Italian ceramics, classic ceramics are not for me. I admire them, I appreciate them. They're not me. So it, it's this primordial element that you're seeking in mm -hmm. your art with all its imperfection. It's, it's the yeah. beginning, the origin. So another take media, another proof that what you're really looking for is in your art is that element that is the beginning of life in every expression and form. Yeah. It's a thing. And even with children, I'm very much interested in the two and three year olds because they have a freshness that it's unschooled, unconditioned. Without roofs too. <laughs> as, as the freedom too, right? Maria, you have also something to add here? Um, yes, so two parts. Um, so I think um, your, your Greek is beautiful and I think that's your heart, right? And so I understand why you've been writing in Greek, but I think that um, you now need to also share your expression in English um, so that I can use some of it with my classes um, and so that you can bridge the two parts of, of your life, um, Thiamu. Um, you've done it in art and I think that um, now's the time to, to embrace the English. Um, but also, I have a question. Now that we have a new, a new life um, in your life, um, how do you see that changing your art? Um, you said that a great source of your decision to go into ceramics came from a place of loss. So how do you see a place of, of gaining, right? Um, a, a place of, of new beginnings impacting your art? Mwah. This is great. Person, creating from joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, creating from joy, yeah. No, to not create out of joy. <laughs> but I, I mean, how do I see it? I don't know. It's. I haven't seen the baby yet to begin with, but uh, I don't think it has anything to do with my art so far. Maybe later, I don't know. And also it's, it's a big, interesting question. What language am I going to communicate with this child? I have two sons with the first one. We speak in Greek. The second in English, and and it's it's a loss. So I don't want to think about it. It will be what will be, but yeah, I, it it does make a difference so far. I have my own stuff, and they have their own life. <laughs> Historia, uh, the story of Infanda was so sad. Well, yes, because. Well, first of all, it's a really interesting thing how a woman was, she wasn't sold, but she was gifted. I mean, she was 
like a doll. They just pushed her to another country, to another everything, environment. And also it's all about Nostos. That's why I chose to read this story. I had many stories I could have uh, translated, but uh, um, by the way, I thank my husband for correcting my translations. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's this Nostos, you know, Vienna is going to be called no matter what you are, an empress, an archiduchess, or a pauper. It's not going to change that. The Nostos is always the same. Yeah, but also, it isn't part of the creative process. We're always trying to find the unattainable, the thing that we don't have, we want to reach it. We'll do our best to maybe arrive there. Desire to finally know who you are. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And that's the mythos of Ariadne that you chose for the topic. Um, tell us about Ariadne. Um, and then the role of mythology. Also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ariadne was a, a hero or heroine. Um, I've always felt compassion for, and I was always mad at Theseus because there's no excuse for him. And of course, you realize what karma is. <laughs> he lost his father because he forgot. And uh, for me, it's like the knowledge. And you know, if you want, media is the same idea, only a little bit different. She helps the stranger, the hero. He takes her with him, but then he betrays, betrays her, I'm talking about media, with some other woman. And uh, Ariadne, the same thing, the, the woman who has the knowledge. And, and she has the key to the way out, the key to the success, to the hero. But then she gets the bad part of the deal or no deal at all. Abandonment. Abandonment, well, there's always revenge. <laughs> not that revenge does anything, you know. Revenge, it's a, not a good idea. But it works for tragedy. So your work is, is really informed from by the Greek mythology, for sure. Well, that's who I am, you know. I grew up, we all, all us Greeks, grew up with this uh, tales, with this myth. We but know. You incorporate <clears throat> your grandma's in, 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 you know, heritage. So oh, I had that grandmother who only went to first uh, first grade, but since she knew how to read, she kept reading and she knew all these amazing fairy tales that she would tell me every night when I was little. And uh, yeah, and, and I loved her and her sister. I loved them both. And I really liked the song that you created. In the beginning, when you showed it to me, I thought it was something that you learned by your, from your grandma. <laughs> so you do the same thing as you do with that value of futuristic. Right. Just around, like in a way with the words. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, the words are a great discipline. First of all, it doesn't, you don't need anything. You need just, a pencil and a paper. Actually, now all you need is your phone. I have written most of my work on my phone. It was funny on, on the Camino because when you go up in elevation, your mind opens. I was stopping and I was writing on the phone. So anyway, I, I mean, it's so great. The word is so great. What has been your, your biggest challenge so far besides the Camino walk? Or do you anticipate something new uh, in your art? Do you want to try other forms or you're stuck with clay and words? The, the, the big worry is time. Mm. 
<laughs> in fact, it's not without a good reason that I did the Camino when I turned 60. I was like, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? <laughs> and, and you know, time is, time is a weird thing. Um, let's shift gears now to how do you feel when your work is sold? Is I love it. I, hmm? I, I love selling my work. You know what? Not because of the money. I no longer sell for $11. That goes without saying. But um, it's again the loss. It's not a loss. It's, it changes how it makes empty space that you're going to fill with more. It gives you the the space to create more. If I had like, I must have made over a thousand pieces all these years. What am I going to do with a thousand ceramics? It's not possible to house them. I know we have Maclena who has a question for you. Maclena, would you like to address it directly? Nancy? Dear uh, Vasiliki, dear Nancy, I'm, I'm really very happy that I had this possibility to, to know you from, from uh, near Apoconda. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to speak in Greek, but I think that for, uh, for the most of the people that are uh, participating here, I think that English. Um, if you want, you can go directly and then uh, Peter or myself, we can translate it for you. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, so it's always a pleasure. I, I really like uh, artists in, in, every, in every dimension. Uh, you are trying to speak with, uh, with the clay. Uh, I and Vasiliki, uh, Vasiliki are trying to speak with the words. So I have two questions for you. And these are questions that I really like to do to, to an artist. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, do you really believe that, that that pain, that loss made you, made you become an artist? It didn't make me become an artist. I was already an artist, but it opened an ocean of creativity because there was so much sentiment inside me that needed an outlet. Otherwise, it would have turned back and hurt me mortally. I, I know it sounds too much, but that's, that's the reality. And it was a friend of mine who noticed that when I, I was telling her I do this and that and that and the other she said, oh my God, there was so much sentiment inside you that needed to come out and take sarka uh, body and, and yeah, body. Yes, I strongly believe that everyone, everyone needs to, to have a, a, a point of start that begins from, from something, something negative and tragic in our life. And the second question, Nancy, if you can, if you could answer is, uh, would you really uh, continue all your life making this art, does this really, uh, does this really fulfill you? Do you really express what you have inside you through, through the clay, through your vessels? Is it enough for you? Uh, I don't just do that. I also am a printmaker. I think I will soon go and start printing again. Um, and uh, I do write and I do that on a daily basis. So I, I have a lot of disciplines to put my energy into. And that's why I said, the only fear I have is time. And I do hope that time is good with me and my hands will not get arthritic and that I will be able, my body will be in a good condition to work. And if not, I can always dictate <laughs> on, on the phone. I mean, but yes, I I can see me creating to the day I will die. Okay, thank you so much, Nancy. Wish you a great 
creative future, more creative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions for Nancy? Nancy, how did you pick up your, your studio's name, Escargot? Is there a story well, behind? Uh, there is a story behind. In Florence, where I was uh, as a student, I made friends with a wonderful person, Leonardo Natoli, who was a student of architecture. And with him, he, he was half Venezuelan, half uh, um, Italian. And with him, we started speaking in French just because, because neither one of us spoke good French. So we thought, and, um, and he, instead of, he, he was very playful. And I say was because unfortunately he died of AIDS 40 days before my second child, Leo, was conceived. Anyway, and he used to call me Escargo, so instead of Exarchu. So every time I would call him, he would pick up the phone and say, Escargo, mon amour, how are you? And uh, when I decided to make a business, I wanted to honor him. Well, I honored him with uh, using his name as my second son's name, but I wanted my studio to be called Escargot because of Leonardo Natoli. You see the losses. And also, Δυσκολεύομαι να μιλήσω στα αγγλικά, ε, να ευχαριστήσουμε την Νάνση για αυτό το υπέροχο ταξίδι, το με τόσο σεβασμό ε, έκανε τη σύνδεση του παρελθόντος με το τώρα μας, όχι και το μέλλον μπορώ να πω, με όλα τα υλικά της τέχνης, ε, με όλες τις μορφές και λόγο και εικόνα. Ε, Νάνση μας συγκίνησε. Ε, Εύχομαι το ταξίδι αυτό να το συνεχίσεις και εμείς να παρακολουθούμε κοντά όλη αυτή τη δημιουργικότητά σου. Σε ευχαριστώ από την καρδιά μου και όλους εσάς, τους φίλους ε, και τους ανθρώπους που φιλοξενούνται εδώ. Να είμαστε όλοι καλά. Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Aristula said a big thank you for this journey that Nancy showed us today and let us walk with her to this amazing journey. Uh, and she particularly mentioned how this journey brings together all dimensions of time, the past, the present, and the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone have questions? We have only four minutes left, so... Um, Feel free to jump in and, and take advantage of time, the time that we have with Nancy. But I certainly encourage you to visit her website, um, her Escargo Studio. So I also encourage you to visit our website, which is citizentales.org. And you can see if you um, feel like you can benefit from joining us, it's free. I would love to have you with us. Um, everybody comes with a project and we support this project to uh, find its way into the public and also for your own self-efficacy. I have only praise for you, Nancy, for this amazing journey that you took us with you. Thank you so much. And um, we want you to, to see the, the, the future work of yours. And um, thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Thank you.